Uh, let me start, you know, there are a lot of things we'll say. We have a very interesting and exciting panel here, lots of subjects to discuss. But, um, you know, one thing that I will say, Joe was very gracious in uh, thanking others. And I think it's my turn to thank Joe, because Joe, uh, you know, I know Joe quite well, and I've known him for many years. And uh, when Joe sort of decides he wants to do something, it gets done. And so that's, uh, we need to thank him collectively for his leadership in this area. <laughs> and I know the goal is never ending. Uh, you know, we can always get better, but to have someone like you uh, leading this effort really is a, is a real privilege, Joe. Now, um, you know, let me say a few words to kick this session off. And we'll talk a lot about data and interoperability and, and the use of data and artificial intelligence, but, you know, some things in healthcare remain the same. People who work in healthcare. Our collective desire to improve people's lives is why we're here, why we're in this industry, why we're in either a provider or, uh, or some kind of participant in the healthcare delivery system or a technology company of some sort trying to uh, also make a difference in healthcare. Uh, it's something that uh, I think, uh, you know, we're lucky that what we have in front of us is, a, is an enduring goal a goal that'll never go away, even if, even if you uh, talk about this, uh, you know, 100 years from now. And not only a goal, an opportunity that'll never go away. And why is that? Well, the two things that I'll state is, first, technology will continue to progress. I think you'll all agree that whatever we do now, 100 years ago, we couldn't have dreamt of. And the next 100 years, you know, who knows what it'll be like, but I can tell you technology will be different and more progressed than what it is today. The other thing that'll never go away is our collective desire to improve people's lives, to live longer, to avoid uh, issues, to, to make uh, the healthcare experience completely safe. And when it goes beyond, when we're perfect in the hospital, if we are at any one time, we'll go beyond the hospital to people's homes to other places. So that desire will never go away. So you put these two together, the progression of technology which is never ending, a quest to improve people's lives in the, in the safest possible way that will also never go away, you have an enduring opportunity. There aren't many industries who can say that. Say that and then achieve a purpose. And so this speech I can tell you every year and remind everyone every year because it will never change. And I think I said some version of this last year, I'm sure. Maybe in different words, but that's, that's how it is, and I'll probably repeat it. Because it is something that we should all be thankful for to be part of this whole movement. But what has changed, at least for me, in the last year, and maybe it's more me than everyone else in that I've gotten more educated about this, but to me, uh, the progression of the, or the explosion of data in front of us in a ubiquitous fashion is something that is also a, um, an event, if you like, that'll happen and only increase over time. Now, that's used in many, many different ways, this explosion of data, not just in healthcare, in our daily lives and in many ways, and other sort of institutions also continue to use them. But added to that is another thing that's happening, and that's or another two things, I'd say. One is our continuous learning of not only how to use the data, but use it intelligently. Use it in a way that a lot of data sometimes is very difficult to grapple with. But we're developing algorithms and methodologies through which that data can be used intelligently, largely using statistics and other, other new techniques, new computational techniques, but one that'll happen. And, and we get better and better at using the data, at personalizing the data. And again, I'm sure there's a progression here that we cannot imagine what the answers will be 10, 20 years from now or longer. The third thing that's happening, which goes back to my original point about technology, is that the computational capabilities are also increasing and we're getting smarter. The use of uh, processes to process data in an intelligent way five years ago was a starting point, or 10 years ago was a starting point. Uh, companies and, uh, and technologists are figuring out how to customize processes to use data uh, both locally as well as from the cloud in a much more intelligent way. And I'm saying all this because these things are really happening in front of us. And certainly to me, 
it's opened my eyes as to the uh, as to the opportunities that we all have to completely transform healthcare in a, in a completely different way. The use of this uh, computational power will lead us to different directions. It leads us to more data available locally, what they call edge computing, on, the, on site. It'll also allow us, through other technologies, to connect with the cloud and other sources and, and data centers to be able to access even more data. And both of these will increase exponentially or at least very rapidly over time. So the opportunities here are endless. And um, it's something that we're all very, I'm sure the audience here, and certainly the panelists, are, are extremely excited about. It's something that I'm excited about, that, that our company is excited about. Uh, but at all times, let's make sure that we don't lose our central focus, why we're here. We're here to improve people's lives and to do it as, in as safe a manner as possible. And that's why we're here. The, the, everything else follows, but that's why we're here. And this opportunity with data and interoperability is a discussion we can have today, but I wanted to give that context. So with that, uh, let me, um, let me uh, ask our panelists to, to come on over. And as they're walking over, I'll, uh, I'll kind of mention um, them one by one. It's uh, Ed Cantwell, who's the, maybe this thing's going to change in a little while. Here, there you go. Ed Cantwell is the president and CEO of the Center for Medical Interoperability. Welcome, Ed. And then we have, uh, let's see who's next here. We have uh, Kathy Kay, whose video we just saw, the patient who will enjoy talking to. Then you have Jan Kimpen, who's the chief medical officer at Philips. We have Dr. Don Rucker, who's the national coordinator uh, for health information technology at HHS. And then finally, my good friend Anders Wall, who's the uh, President and Chief Ex Executive Officer at, uh, for Clinical Care Solutions at uh, GE Healthcare. So please, please take a seat. I'll join you here. And um, you know what I'll do here is uh, start off a series of questions, and um, and maybe you can um, you can kind of dive in. I've got some notes and stuff here, but we all agreed that we're free will to the degree that we can because it's a topic with all kinds of possibilities. Um, I wanted to start with Kathy. Um, you know, from a patient perspective, uh, I, you know, the video demonstrated how you felt about it and the experience that you had. But as you reflect on it, and specifically when you go home, when these alerts don't exist and you carry on your day-to-day -day living, how do, you, how do you think about how these alerts in your own mind, can progress in the next, you know, not two, three years, but 20 years? I hate to put you on the spot, <laughs> but, but, this, <laughs> but you can say what you want. I'm not sure. Um, How do you think about it at home, for example? I'm sorry? How do you think about it when you're at home and there's about no alerts? About being home? Yeah. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I honestly feel that I probably, had it not been for the AAM yeah. system, yeah. I probably would have been sent home sooner than I was uh -huh. because my temperature was not elevated enough from my experience of having been an RN, was not elevated enough to have kept me in the hospital. I could have gone home with pneumonia and who knows where that would have progressed. You know, pneumonia can be pretty yeah. dangerous. So that's, that's um, worth reflecting on. Right. The fact that um, because of that condition and you were in the hospital, in fact, you got treated. That's, that's I had never been in the hospital uh, other than to have my children back in the 60s and early right. 70s. However, as an RN, I was the caregiver for patients in a hospital. So when I was admitted to Kaiser, um, I was going to be the perfect patient. I wasn't going to complain. I wasn't going to use a call light any more than I had to, because I, having been a caregiver, I understand 
how busy nurses can be. Yeah. And it wasn't until this um, rapid response team came and quickly moved me to telemetry to monitor my heart rate, um, had a, a lung scan to check for a possible pulmonary embolus, and that's when they, with the x-ray, they found out the pneumonia. Everything just progressed. Um, I can see, having sat here yesterday and listening to the ideas of patient implementing ideas for patient safety, between that and the technology of this AAM, I can see where the goal of zero pre preventable death can be achieved. Indeed. I, I really do. I, I really see that, that as, a, as a great possibility. I think that's, uh, that's absolutely a worthy goal and one that uh, you know, we can get there. Th these are, like Joe pointed out in the opening, it's a matter of people doing things mm -hmm. that we know what to do. Right, right. And we do it in other industries and so on, and it's a matter of doing it in healthcare. It's not that simple because you've got more variables, but in the end, it is an achievable goal. But let me turn now to Ed a little bit and um, you know, talk about the liquidity of data on the same notion. Because I do think that you know, it's tough enough actually to get to the zero goal in the hospital. It requires a lot of work and, and coordination and discipline and technology to be able to do this. But eventually, you know, the data liquidity uh, is a critical factor. And eventually, this is going to go to the home. Uh, and any thoughts as a provider, and I know you've had some personal experience as well, but as a provider, what are your thoughts on data liquidity? Well, I think the average citizen that is in that hospital bed with that wonderful gown on assumes that all of the clinical modalities that are working to keep the patient alive has complete interoperability, which produces the term data liquidity, if you've not heard of that term. It is the, f it, the ability for data to go anywhere and everywhere. But the issue with healthcare is trust. Is there a platform that is, is designed that brings all of the wonderful clinical modalities and allows those modalities to interplay so that analytics and deep learning and machine learning can be applied, but in a trusted way, not only from the patient's point of view, but from the industry's point of view, from a litigation point of view and a liability point of view. So I, th I think in many ways 2019 is going to be the year of trust. The, the CEOs on this panel, the CEOs on my board at the center have the ability to define what that means, mm -hmm. what interoperability means, what data liquidity means, and more importantly, what trust means. If you can get on a 747 for 17 hours and fly across the ocean. You trust the pilot, you trust the airplane, you trust the crew. So I, I think we've got to bring trust to the person. Mm -hmm. And what's nice about the person, the person's gonna carry that trust with them, whether yeah. they're at home, in their car, at work, or in the hospital. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the things um, that enables that trust, which we all got to remind ourselves is why we're here. We're all here for a common purpose, and as long as we believe that, the trust will happen. I mean, it's easier said than done because you've got other things that get in the way sometimes, but, but as long as we keep focusing on that, that we're all here for a common purpose, that trust, I'm, I'm sure, eventually will, will occur. I agree. But uh, let, me, let, let me now um, uh, turn to uh, Don a little bit. Um, you know, you're, you're in the government, okay? So you're yes. in charge of regulation, okay? <laughs> Amongst other things. <laughs> And um, in many ways, a regulator has to trust, but also verify uh, and set policy. Um, I have really two questions for you. One is um, your views on uh, how do you make this, um, this, this sort of sense of togetherness that we can all have, but at the same time, you can have rules. Because even unintentionally, things can break down, and what, what rules are there for, 
are that people follow a certain discipline and certain consistency uh, and are held accountable for that. How do you, in your experience, how do you uh, implement that um, in a way that that doesn't become a, only a stick as opposed to a carrot in some ways? So I'd love your thoughts on that. Yeah. So, I, you know, it, it's a great question. I think there's a, a fascinating interplay of technology and one piece of law that is, is coming together, and I think in a, uh, in a good way here for, for patient safety. The law, let me start with that, is the 21st Century Cures Act passed almost unanimously December yep. of 2016. Um, you know, a lot of the underlying work by the Obama administration, I assure you that <coughs> Trump administration is extremely interested in interoperability. I was over at the White House on Thursday with senior staff working on all of this. And what we're trying to do is get the data that you talked about, Omar, get that out to patients on their smartphone. There is great technology. We all have smartphones. We all know. We want to get that, you know, restful Jason fire. Those are nerd terms. You can look them up. But we want to get that modern technology stack to work on health care in the electronic medical record. Um, so that's the center point, is getting that modern technology stack out there. There's some rulemaking going on on prevention of information blocking so that clinicians have to share data and some of the APIs, application programming interfaces, and trust networks to do this. But I think it's an, an interesting combination, and to make it not burdensome, what we're trying to do is use industry standards on computing to get this out to patients. We're also trying to get it out to researchers on a population level. So we're doing some things that we think will have a very light regulatory, I mean, it's never light, let's not kid ourselves, but a manageable regulatory footprint and a lot of empowerment, that's the goal, and uh, you know, we welcome people's comments on that, and the rule will be out soon for formal comment as well. But one, one question that I do have, uh, coming from an industry where we treat um, a lot of patients in an acute state, um, in a world like that, which, which I think uh, will uh, accelerate innovation in many ways, yeah. because you get more ideas um, working together. Um, you'll have an end solution that is derived from different sub-solutions which are created by different entities or individuals for that yes. matter. Um, in a world like that, who reports an MDR? MDR is, a, is an issue that happens that causes a patient safety problem that gets reported that it, Industry is required right. to report. Uh, so who reports it? Well, obviously there's deep specifics on the you know the FDA language on those things. Mm -hmm. I think in, in modern computing, we're asked that question a lot. It usually comes up as a security question, as opposed well, to yeah, uh, you know a yeah. security question, as opposed to a um, you know litigation responsibility question. A lot of this is becoming increasingly auditable, which of course is also good from a patient safety point of view, because we have a lot more data to understand, for example, the events that happened to, to, to Ms. K here computationally. So I think it's actually interesting going to be a lot clearer in the future, but I may just be an optimist. <laughs> yeah, it'll work itself out, I'm sure. Yeah. But it is one that is, um, is quite a change to the way in which uh, regulations are structured. And I, I see Anders itching to yeah, comment on I, that. I just so wanted to, to make a couple of comments, and, and for sure we, we will be battling with this for, for a long time going forward. I, I reflect on this based on the comment uh, yesterday in the opening when we talked about uh, physicians, nurses, uh, health care givers will be potentially be pilots in the future and think uh, back to the aviation business uh, where basically 99% is automated by now. So this is going to be a question about the black box when th bad things happen, or where are we with that? Th that's really the question, because today the industry will be really very, very uh, you know, uh, curious to know and, and, and careful, obviously, because it's all about the patient at the end of the day. Nobody wants to, to do anything wrong here. So, so anything you would like to say, uh, guide us a little bit on the industrial side. How, how can we do this better? Because I think we're thinking about bringing the right data, and we're even thinking to the next level where we want to give you analytics, we'll give the potentially predictions, 
they will mark, won't make your, your decisions. So there is a step away from that part, but there could be a lot of faults be before we get there. Yeah, I, so uh, the promise of analytics has been out there a long time as a grad student at, at Stanford and AI in the 80s, so the first heyday of AI, and, and we know how that sort of turned out. I think right now it is still challenged to do explanation on these algorithms, and so I think we're gonna have to have the things we rely on are going to have to have multiple parallel approaches till we solve the explanation problem. And that has not been solved in artificial intelligence yeah. or in machine learning. So until that happens in a robust way, I think we're going to have to have very layered approaches. Um, that's an unsatisfying answer, but I yeah. think, yeah, I think that's, what it, that's yeah. what it is. Yeah. 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 Let, let me bring uh, Jan into this conversation. Um, Jan, you know, Philips um, has a history is focused on healthcare, but also has a history with consumers. So um, compared to other sort of more, uh, as a starting point, a pure medical technology company, you know, medical technology companies typically work with hospitals, providers, that's the stakeholder. And consumers are patients, and as data becomes available to patients, like we just heard, in this, in this world, um, the stakeholders are different. Like, uh, uh, to a physician, we provide a New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, with evidence, mm -hmm. and they read it and <coughs> say, this is a good thing, and we're going to do it, or certain processes. You know, a patient isn't going to read all that stuff, uh, yet they'll have the data. And, but, but you've got a history in consumer uh, management, so, and in your medical uh, practitioner yourself, uh, so I'd love to get your unfiltered thoughts as to uh, how, how does the world change? Uh, as, as medical data becomes ubiquitous with patients who are not structured in the same way in which a physician or a hospital system is. Yes, Omar, I think you're, you are completely right that uh, we are talking a lot about a hospital. Yeah. Uh, the, the hospital environment, and that, that can be a, ba a dangerous place um, uh, where, f where mistakes can happen. And everybody is talking about bringing the data to the patient at home, bringing the patient at home and leaving the patient at home and treating and monitoring the patient at home. And indeed, we have learned from our deep consumer intimacy over the years how you can do that. And in, in our opinion, you, you need to go through three steps. And the first step is really to engage with the patient, to get buy-in. And I had, a, I had a wonderful conversation with, uh, with Cathy and her, her daughter uh, day before yesterday. And there you see it. You need to convince the patient, if you want to treat her at home, to buy into your system. And sometimes you have to bring in bystanders to help with that. And sometimes you have to, buy, to bring in family practitioners to do that. And we have learned that the hard way in, uh, when, when we rolled out a home monitoring uh, solution in one of our big IDNs here in the, in the US, that the take up by patients was not big, not high, until we asked the family practitioner to be part of the game, and then it took off. So that's the first step. The second step is to make, to make the, the experience very, very, very good. Give hardware software and solutions that are attractive for the, for the patient to use, easy to use. Mm -hmm. the, the patient experience should be seamless. Um, sleep, sleep solutions are a wonderful, uh, a wonderful example of that, where you, where you create a closed loop that is enabled by artificial intelligence that gives patients who have to wear masks or because they have sleep apnea or other sleep problems, they get immediately feedback in the morning how, how, yep. how they slept in the night. So that's the second one. Create an experience for the patient that is attractive to keep on using in a trustful and, and, and consistent way the, the, uh, the tooling you deliver to them. And the third very important part is be transparent about the results, the outcomes, both for the individual patient, but also for the community at large, yeah. so that we can slowly build the trust. So I think these three steps yeah. will be necessary to go into uh, more home treatment and go mon go, uh, home monitoring without the patient disengaging from this new tooling. Yeah, that's great. That's, uh, that's, that, that's good, very appropriate thoughts, especially the closed loop one, mm -hmm. because that automates it. 
to a degree and eventually over time personalizes it. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, you can make it really very customized for an individual and yeah. it learns over time. Yeah. I think that, is a, that might have to happen in concurrence. Yeah, absolutely. With that. Uh, let me come back to Ed. Ed, I'm, I'm still, uh, um, you know, you, you're in the center of medical, uh, uh, you're running the center for medical interoperability and, and I'm sure you've, you've kind of, at least in your mind, wrestled with this notion of who takes accountability. Because the, the, in all these examples, uh, if you really want to optimize the system with the ubiquitousness of data, you'll have different people coming up with solutions. In a closed loop system, maybe that uh, you're sensing from uh, one company's device, you're uh, using a cloud-based algorithm from some other company, and you're delivering treatment through another company's device. It can happen. You have three different companies or institutions involved in this, and if it's today, that doesn't happen. First, because the interoperability is not that, <laughs> that, you know, that clear. <clears throat> Second, you know, I, I don't think data is moving that quickly yet. But if you fast forward, that's what we'll get to. So how are you thinking? Uh, and then let's start with the hospital alone, because um, at least you've got some sort of control mechanisms there. But how are you thinking about that as to uh, if something goes wrong, who does what? You know, one guy says it's his fault, the other guy says it's his fault. Everyone's sympathetic, but no one does anything. <laughs> then, then what happens? So um, almost within a month, the, the Center for Medical Interoperability was created when Joe launched the first data pledge. And we got the opportunity to study most every other industry on how they went from analog to digital and how they made data the currency of innovation and how the ultimate trust with the consumer was achieved. So when I, I think in many ways, healthcare is going through that same transition. We're going from analog to digital, but because we were never designed to be a system, a national system, we have to untangle the spaghetti. Personally, the, the center was formed with the thought that the CEOs that represent the health systems, which are, are similar to the CEOs of airlines, have to step up and look at this as a system level problem. They have to do system level design where all aspects are, are considered before they operationalize the platform. But to think that we're going to not, or be able to not come together as a platform, uh, I think is a fallacy and will we'll stay, uh, we'll stay uh, as a low performing industry. So it, it's, it's a bit of uh, political leadership, it's a bit of technical leadership, but it is leadership. And the one thing that just amazed me when I studied the other industries is in the end, it came down to between five and eight individuals mm -hmm. that created most of the other industries where the consumer feels they're wrapped with technology and trust. So I think it's a design issue. Mm -hmm. What I'm excited about is we have the leaders that can sit in the room to do it. Sure. Um, then let me bring Anders back. Um, you know, Anders, I had um, actually uh, a, a thought for you about uh, technology. Okay. As, as technology progresses, you know, there is another dimension, which may be further ahead than, than what's uh, appropriate right now, but I'd love your thoughts on that. You know, there's another dimension to this. I just gave the example where, 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 you know, there's data in the cloud and people do algorithms and go back and forth. The other progression that's happening is through the march of technology, actually the computational capability and the data capability at the, at the end point, which they call this uh, edge uh, computing, actually will increase. And, and Maybe what then happens is that this closed loop example that I gave resides within the same thing. So it's not interoperable because it doesn't have to be interoperable. It's all within one device that's put into somebody and it's all kind of closed there. And maybe there's another level of interoperability at another loop that might happen. But how are you thinking about the, 
about the intelligence of the device on the patient. Mm -hmm. And uh, how's that going to change everything? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great uh, crystal ball question in a way, but uh, we, yeah. we certainly You're right, have crystal ball. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we, we are working on, on, on a lot of these things at the moment. So, so yeah. let, let me just take a one step back before you answer the question. Yeah. So, and relate to some of the other conversation here. Clearly, we think all the data is going to be there. It's going to be way too much data for anybody to interpret. So there has to be some analytics predict uh, and predictability around it. At the same time, there's a one big missing point because we just look at pieces of, of the puzzle. So, so the whole precision health uh, uh, understanding needs to be adopted by the industry, uh, even though we operate in silos or pieces as, as we go. So that, that is one piece and that has to be personalized. That, at least the belief and what we see today, we have strategies in, in that direction. But it has to follow with legislation, it has to follow with uh, how we uh, operate together, uh, things like that. At the same time, to your question, there is going to be a huge win if we could improve things basically at the bedside or with the patient directly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think as we kind of dream of this big journey about precision health, we have to attack that in the meantime. So in our thinking, is, uh, and I just take a very simple example, uh, we all know that alarms is, is great in one way, but uh, if you look at the data, I think t between 2010 and 2015, FDA logged something like 500 deaths because people did, didn't react, understand malpractice uh, alarms. That's something happening right at the patient, right there. The data was understood, but not... Yep. So we can do something right there. Automated. O automated on the spot. Yep. That can happen. Yep. And, and there are... We just have to be smarter about presenting it in, in the right way. I think the industry has come from a very you know, uh, simple way, uh, assuming that the operator knows everything, can deal with 100 different data points and make a decision. And we know that the operator variability, decision-maker uh, variance is, is, is really uh, a, a big, big issue. So we can do a lot from the industrial point to do that. Yeah, I think. I think that's a fair point. Did you want to comment? Yeah, it, I, I think you asked the question, who is going to be responsible? Because we all bring yeah. parts of it to the yeah. hospital and also to the home. I think honestly that if, you, if we want to save lives, we can't afford it anymore to do it in silos. Nobody can do it alone, so we will have to work together. Yeah. And, and, and we see it in, in, in our company, and I'm convinced that you see it in yours, and, and, and also Anders see it uh, in, in GE. Our customers, our hospital uh, uh, C-suite, they, they don't want single products anymore, lesser and less. So just yeah. They want an end-to-end -end solution and somebody that's connecting all these, all, all, all these building blocks for them. So whether we like it or not, and we better like it because that's going to save lives in the end. We ha will have to work with our with, with, with building blocks yes. from other companies yes. being the integrator. And each one of us will have these long-term this, this long strategic partnerships with, 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 with the customers. And it is our obligation to build in and tie in also the good stuff that other people are bringing to the market in order to make it an end-to-end -end solution. And I could talk on some of these uh, uh, partnerships that we have where we can prove that 40% of the building blocks we bring into the end-to-end -end solution, for example, in the imaging department, comes from other vendors, from third yeah. vendors. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if we are not prepared to do that, we will keep in the box selling mode and we will keep losing patients on, on, yeah. on the goal. No, I, I don't think uh, if anyone is in this industry for any length of time, um, it's it's clear that that's not a that's not a train you want to stop. <laughs> you want to get on yeah. and and use. I, I think I think I think you'll get general agreement there. Uh, I do think though your point about uh, everyone being on board with a common purpose and and, and trust yeah. and figure out together how the rules. I think we have to work together yeah. on this one. I just just want to say one thing because the the movement ha have done a fantastic job already. But if I look at 89 companies signed off. Yeah. There are thousands out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be successful with anything here, 
we need to make that uh, move much, much faster. That's the foundation for all, all we're talking about here. So if maybe maybe a nudge from legislation can help it in the right direction, but I think we as an industry have an obligation here to, to drive that much faster, the adoption. I, I think we talk a little bit about the global view here. We have thousands of companies out there that need to find a standard, a way to, to do yeah. this, otherwise it's not going to work. I, th I think the other subject, in, uh, and I'll just a uh, couple of more questions, and then we'll, we'll, I'll look at the questions from the audience here. Um, the other subject, at least, that, uh, that we've thought about a lot uh, in this world of not only uh, interoperability, but also of data ubiquity, um, is cybersecurity. Uh, that, you know, there's people out there who can, who can do things. Uh, and uh, that's happened in other spaces, and it'll happen. You have to assume that'll happen in healthcare. So, uh, you know, I'll start with Anders, and then I'll, uh, and then actually I'll ask uh, Don a little bit. But, but uh, uh, how are you? Uh, yeah. How are you thinking about that? Oh, foundational. It's it's uh, it's uh, a very very tough challenge, as we have seen over the last few years, with the one attack after the other, and then obviously our systems. There can't be a question on equipment. Just can't be a single question about how secure is the data, how how accurate is the, the measurements. Does it work every single day, every single second? So we're taking this very very serious, and in fact, in our in our company, and I'm sure you all have the same, we have we, uh, we something like 4 million systems out there globally. And some of them are up to eight, 20 years old. How do you protect that against yeah. security, data security today? So we have a monumental job just even to cover the existing install base so of customers and take care of that. So that's the first line of action. And obviously, everything going forward, we have to we have a huge team trying to, to protect uh, against a any malfunction, basically. So this is a, the number one priority for the company before anything else we do. Mm -hmm. So that ties right back to, to patient safety. Mm. And um, um, Don, from a um, regulatory and a, and a, and a policy perspective, uh, there are other groups in the, in the government who are you know, huge experts in this area dealing with all kinds of issues. So uh, how are you thinking about this? And from a healthcare regulatory perspective, IT perspective, um, love your thoughts. Yeah, I think that, you know, there's, it, it, it's obviously a vast and daunting challenge. Everybody knows that. I, you know, I think we break it apart into a little bit of two areas. One is under the HIPAA privacy law. So there's a broad law that, that covers that. And those entities, there are a number of things with technology and with uh, policy, right? Because most of the security breaches are really behavioral. They're not, they're not really brilliant exercises and hacking. They're, they're behavioral things around passwords. I think there's one set of policies there that are, that are out there. And for that, from, certainly from our point of view, the thing that's most important is that we not put in any policies that prevent the best technology security from being used. We don't want healthcare, we don't want to anchor people to older technologies. We want to make sure that the newest and best security policies are used in our space and be very conscious of that. The second area that's very interesting, under cures, patients are going to have access to their own data electronically. Today, you can get your data on a portal but realistically, it's still on somebody else's computer in somebody else's system. There's some ways to download it. In the future, when you get your data on your app, on your smartphone, HIPAA does not, HIPAA has stopped. That is your data. And I think we're gonna have to have some national understanding of you know, what's shared. And we're already having this, right? Look at all the congressional discussions about Facebook and Google, right? All of that is, ultimately data that we collectively have decided to put out there for whatever good or bad reasons. We're going to have a similar discussion, I think, around patient-controlled healthcare data and apps. We're, from a regulatory point of view, making sure those things have, you know, the state-of-the-art security and, you know, I think it's still a work in progress on educating patients there. So those are the ways we look at it, and it, it is, um, as everybody knows, very nuanced in how do you bridge those gaps between patient empowerment and security when you have these highly distributed streams of data. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm looking at one of the questions here, which has triggered another thought of that um, on the, along those lines. The question here says, uh, and I'll comment on it a little bit as well, how can we democratize patient data without compromising on patient privacy? Which, you know, sort of go against each other a little bit. But, but let me just throw out an example of a potential scenario and then let, you, let everyone comment on it. Um, I'll take Kathy's example where uh, she said that uh, she was in fact lucky that she was in the hospital for an unrelated reason uh, and then she had this issue and there was those things in place that took care of her. While if this happened at home, you know, it would have been very difficult. Now, in today's world, things that are highly controversial regarding individual privacy, um, people can look at text messages and behaviors and where you are and what you're doing and actually predict a, a potential condition and save somebody's life. You know, someone uh, is clinically depressed and, and uh, maybe you diagnose that through the nature of their messages using AI and machine learning well before they actually go to see a doctor. Uh, so, you, you know, in, in, the, in the holistic world of safety, it's a good thing. But if I put a patient privacy or an individual privacy lens on that, I can hear all kinds of discussions about you're encroaching into my life and all this stuff. And, and so how do, we, how do we all collectively like, think about that? So I'll let... Well, I, th I think one area that, that we have to think about, and I think this, this forum is a great, is to think about what consent means, right? Yeah. Because ultimately, um, do I choose to let my smartphone knowledge of whether I've moved or not moved or how fast I've moved or where I've moved, right? I mean, we have accelerometers on ourselves, you yeah. know, 24-7 now almost, right? Yeah. Maybe not at night. Um, so I think that, I think collectively we have to think about what consent means. We have not figured that out. We haven't figured it out computationally and we haven't figured it out as a society. And I think that's really the part of it. And from a policy point of view, we have to use very, very primitive, very coarse consent yes. mechanisms today, right? That form you sign when you go to the ER, let's say, you know, I agree to share everything, right? And of course you're sick, you're not gonna read this even <laughs> if you could read it. Um, it goes on for two pages. So I, I don't know what the answer is, but we're gonna have to we'll sort source. out consent. Yeah. Kathy, I'd love your views we'll on the this. source. <laughs> because, uh, you know, as a patient, um, if uh, someone, if you're at home, and some could have, one could have predicted what you were going to have without having to go to the hospital, but to do that, they'd have looked at where you are, what you eat, what you do, what behaviors you have, and who you're talking to, all that stuff. Uh, but they find out that you have a problem, and if you get treated, you'll get, your life will be saved. So how do you, as a patient, how do you deal with that kind of dilemma of, of the trade-off between privacy and actually upfront knowledge of uh, your conditions so your life can be saved? It's a tough question again, but uh, <laughs> you're, you're just your free thoughts. It's like being back in the hospital. Isn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I really have to apologize because it, uh, there seems to be a reverberation of the voice and I'm not okay. sure what you had asked me. Okay, so let me, let me repeat that. Um, the conversation that we just had was the... Um, was the conflict in many ways between an individual's privacy and someone monitoring through your behavior, through electronic tools like your smartphone, what you're up to, and through that, concluding that you actually have a condition for which you need to go to a hospital. And without that monitoring, you'd never know. But it is an encroachment on your privacy. So, you know, most people don't like their privacy to be encroached, but in this situation, your life could be saved. So how do you think about that as a patient, as an individual? I'm not sure, to be honest. <laughs> None of us are, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if, I would be, if I would be your doctor, yes. okay. if I would be your doctor, and, and I would tell you, Listen, Katie, I, I can monitoring, monitor you at home if you want. Right, right. But then you have to give me access to oh, all your data. Oh, and how do I feel maybe, about the Maybe your Facebook data, maybe where you live, 
maybe on what you do all the day. Would, would you be comfortable with that? I'm not sure, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm, I am not a technical, technical, technology wise. Um, recently got rid of my flip phone, <laughs> but <laughs> and don't know how to use the iPhone. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I've heard people talk about how the computer uh, can be hacked and personal information can be taken from it. Um, th that's a difficult question for me because I don't understand how it can be hacked. I'm not sure that I have anything in my computer that I wouldn't want anybody to have um, as For far sure as you have, I guess. medical yeah. records. Um, they're available to anybody in the hospital that really wants to look at them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It just... I, I think, uh, I certainly know what you mean. I think the answer to that is going to be a, a big variance. You know, we go to, depends on which, right? it's big going variance. to be a lot of different things. People have every view of no completely open, share everything. And then we have leg legislation depending on wh what, what country you are in. There are different yep. rules. Right. So, so it's not clear, but I think what we can do, and, and sitting here at, at this uh, movement, uh, we should have much more conversation about this so people understand what, what, what is at risk, what you can gain and what, what the risk is. And I don't think that's clear to a lot of people. If somebody's uh, really interested in getting your information, well, it, they're going to find a way to get yeah. it. It's, it's the job to be done I at this point in healthcare because we've watched Facebook and Instagram right. go to the other extreme yes. uh -huh. and invade your privacy. But why isn't, there, why isn't there a personal longitudinal health record trust platform that allows your personal trust to engage with your health system? I mean, that's a wonderful idea for an app, right? Because I think the, it's up to this industry whether we gain trust or lose trust at the personal level. And, and if you gain trust, think of who has a personal longitudinal health record in this room that's divorced from the portal that they go to with their health system provider? That's a market opportunity. And, and the industry that does that correctly is going to win and that's why the threat from the non-healthcare digital powerhouse players, you know, is so daunting to our industry. So, you know, we're running out of time here. Um, let me just um, ask you each to say a few uh, closing words, but add in a response to one of these questions, which I'll summarize, which is uh, essentially, how do you create aff affordability in data liquidity? But I'll expand the question by saying, how do you, how do you monetize? Or how, because in the end, there has to be some kind of uh, financial valuation of all of these. And, um, and your own thoughts as you're dealing with this as to how we should approach that. And then add in anything else that you want to the conclusion. So let me okay. start with Anders and we'll Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a great question. And of course, uh, in an industry, we, have, we, we, we can't only think about the patient, although that comes first. And we yeah. want to make a, a, a difference uh, and, and, uh, in people's lives and save them. But um, <coughs> I don't think it's m very different from what we have today. If we put not data as a focus, not the equipment as a focus, but the outcome as a focus. Mm -hmm. If we can tie that, again, and come back to, could we change the way we pay, the way we operate, and get much more focus on outcome and, and have all the data in the outcome? It is partly the precision health part, but, but we can do much more in that direction. Mm -hmm. that so it's data plus the action gives us the outcome. Mm -hmm. And that will be kind of the, the way I hope we can go. Yep, that's, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, um, we think the real problem in healthcare is affordability. I think often interoperability is a proxy for affordability. And um, we think open APIs can absolutely lead to new business models, new ways of taking care of patients. We've seen this in our lifetimes in industry after industry. Many of us took Uber or Lyft to get here. You look at banking, you look at brokerage, you look at media, you look at printing, you look at music. Um, 
APIs have changed all of those businesses. Healthcare is absolutely right for that. And uh, from our point of view, we are consciously working that the things, uh, you know, the rulemaking, the policies we do actually allow new business entrants and new business models. I think that'll happen actually, yeah. I, I want to be very short. We started with the consumer, and I think when we are evolving this field, let's stay very, very, very close to the patient and try to understand what the unmet needs are there and the challenges are there in order to move this forward. Great, thank you. Cathy, any final thoughts? I don't have anything more to add. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, it's great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for your participation and your thoughts and your engagement. I, I just have to say I'm so grateful to the, yeah. Thank you. the programs, the things that are done. Thank you. Ed? Just thanks for your leadership. I, I, you know, I, I think it is going to be a year of leadership, and t to Joe, your leadership, because... Uh, you know, he who leads is the leader. So. Great. Well, we're out of time right now. Thank you very much. We could talk for another hour on a whole variety of subjects in this area. But it's been a very engaging discussion. Enjoyed it. Hope it was useful. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.